So let's go ahead and get started with the episode here. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was Ariana Grande. Now, Ariana Grande, pop superstar. I don't really think she needs more introduction than that. She's 25 years old. She looks like she's 16. I actually used to watch that show she was on, Victorious. It's funny because she was probably the most entertaining slash most annoying character on that show. But yeah, out of all of them, she wasn't the one I thought would be world famous. But it's cool that she is. I enjoy her music. And, you know, her music's pretty good. I do have uh, probably four, the first four or five albums. I'm I'm not for sure. I haven't bought anything recently. But, yeah, I, it's enjoyable. I, I enjoy a good rap music, and I enjoy top 40 pop music. It's a weird combination. but So, Ariana Grande. But it's not like Kanye West where I will be like, oh, I really like Kanye West even though he he's like a total weirdo. I make excuses for him because I like him so much. Ariana Grande is a pop star who I buy albums from. There are some artists that I will defend to the death. So when Kanye West is floating around on a glass stage or dressing up as like a giant block person or doing that incredibly insane Saturday Night Live performance, I'll be like, no, he's you guys just don't understand the genius of Kanye West. Ariana Grande is like, oh, she's a... She is a good pop star. She's good at what she does. I'm always afraid she's going to blow her vocal cords out, though. I remember... Anyways, it's enough talking... It's enough of me reminiscing about Ariana Grande. Let's get on to the story. So, Ariana Grande. She said that she had a encounter with ghosts slash demons. Really, demons. Now, everyone kind of has a story about ghosts and demons. Well, most people do, but very rarely are they so big in the public eye that they're interviewed by Complex Magazine, and it's just like a weird aside in this article. The interviewer is like, oh, you have nice hair, oh, you know, what's up for your next project, da-da-da-da-da, and then the conversation starts to steer towards the dark, the macabre. And so what happened was, This is the story that Ariana Grande told to Complex Magazine in 2013. So she went to Kansas City. She was on tour, I'm assuming, because I don't think that's an area that Ariana Grande would normally hang out in. But anyways, first she said she's really into ghost stuff, paranormal stuff, which I will say, guys, the boo pill, I'm telling you, if you express an interest in the paranormal, girls will flock to you, even Ariana Grande will flock to you. So, Ariana Grande is in Kansas City. And first she says they go visit a haunted castle. Now, I looked that up, and I'm there's no castles in Kansas, but there is something called the Sowers Castle, which is a haunted building, and I think that's what she was referring to. And I looked at the hauntings there, and it was just like a ball of light, or like the shadow of a dude walks through, I was like, ah, it's lame. I'm not going to spend time talking about it. But anyway, so she went there. She probably thought the same thing. And then her and her friends were like, let's go to Stoll Cemetery. So Stoll Cemetery is considered one of the seven gateways to hell. It's one of the seven places on earth that the devil can enter into our reality. And we'll get into more of that in a second. But let me finish the Ariana Grande portion of this story. So Ariana Grande is talking to Complex Magazine, and she says that the Pope won't fly over Stoll Cemetery. So in the, I think it was the 70s or the 80s, when Pope John Paul was flying, not like, like Superman, but his jets, <laughs> would not, his jet will not fly over the cemetery, the, he had the pilot divert his plane so it wouldn't fly over Stoll Cemetery, because it's unholy land. We'll get more into that as well. But anyway, so... The Pope's plane won't fly over it. Her and her friends went there at night. And the car, the smell of the car was full of sulfur. (laughs) And Ariana Grande started to feel sick. There's just this negative energy filled the car up. And then there was a fly in the car. Now, a fly is the sign of a demon. We'll, We'll get into that. We'll address all of these things, but let me tell you the rest of this story. Just flying the car. Now, she rolls down the window and she yells out to Stoll Cemetery, We apologize, we didn't mean to disrupt your peace. And she takes a picture, which, I, I take take it as a human. So let's say, like, some kids are, like, 
bugging you and you're sitting there and then someone goes we're sorry we, we didn't mean to disrupt your peace and you're thinking oh those are good kids and then they pull out a camera and take a picture of you and drive off anyways this picture apparently showed three distinct faces which ariana grande described as textbook demons so you imagine like horns maybe a long face big grin things like that now of course the interviewer for complex magazine asks what any normal person would ask right away where's the picture And not in an accusatory tone, just like, wow, that's an amazing story. I want to see that picture. She deleted it because it was possessed, basically. It was a dark picture. She said she tried to send the picture to her manager, and when she put it as an attachment in the email, or sent it through SMS or however she did, it said this file is too large. It's 666 megabytes. Oh, dude. And then um, she said she started to see this this shadowy figure. So this is actually from the interview. This is a, uh, this is what Ariana Grande said. I was going to sleep about two weeks ago. Now 2013, not now. I had just gotten off the phone, and as soon as I closed my eyes, I heard this really loud rumble right by my head. When I opened my eyes, it stopped immediately. But when I closed my eyes, it started again with whispers. Every time I closed my eyes, I started seeing these really disturbing images with, like, red shapes. Then I opened my eyes and got back on the phone, and I was like, I'm I'm really scared, and I don't want to go to bed tonight. And then I scooched over to the left side of my bed, because that's where the best service is in the room. And there was this massive black matter. I don't know what it was. It was like a cloud of something black right next to me. I, I started crying. I was on the phone like, what do I do? What do I do? And they said... Not the ghost, not the ghost, the person on the phone said, tell it to F off. I thought, I'm not going to do that, it's it's going to upset it. So I'm just going to chill and not feed into it, and because all it wants is my fear, it feeds on fear. I watched it move to the front of my bed, and then I fell asleep on the phone. I woke up and it was gone. The next night, my friend Tyler was staying with me. She said she was trying to sleep and her body felt paralyzed. And she described the exact same thing I saw. And then the interviewer goes, alrighty then, and moves on to the next topic. Which, I guess the interviewer really was there to do an article for Complex Magazine about the lives and times of this glamorous singer. But it it seemed like she was just like, uh, very dismissive of her. And that's the thing, when people tell paranormal stories, things like that, I try to be, when it's face-to-face, I know when I was reading that, it was kind of smarmy, but I'm going to get into elements of that, elements of her whole story. Generally, when people tell me a story face-to-face, no matter how incredulous it is, I'll be like, oh yeah, that's really interesting. And then, I mean, of course, there's a point where you have to break it off, but... A lot of times when people have these experiences, unless they're lying right to your face, which happens time to time, to them it's almost like a religious experience. And they're also really reluctant to tell people. So when you tell a story to someone and you go, all righty then, then they're really going to stop sharing those stories with anyone. And these are just personal stories that people go through. So let's let's look at this quickly. Because there's a couple of elements that I want to touch on here. And I'll, I'll start off by doing this. So in, because I'll forget otherwise, I had a plan and then I realized something while I was reading her quote. So let me touch on with this. The, there may be a biological answer to this, but the thing where she says that she closed her eyes and she would hear something and then she opened them and it went away. She closed her eyes and she would hear a noise. She opened it and, and it went away. I didn't repeat myself. That actually happened a few times. So I've experienced that. And I don't know if... I never thought... When I read this story, when I was prepping the story, that didn't stick out to me. It wasn't until I was kind of taking my time reading it. That happened to me. It happened to me one time where I was trying to sleep and there was something... uh, I'll tell the story. This episode's probably just going to end up running long. But I was sleeping at my grandma's house in my room bordering the backyard, which is where I said there's been some... I had paranormal experiences with shadow people and things like that. I remember one night, because my I, I didn't really have a bed. I had like a, a futon mattress on the floor. And one night I was... And so it was a futon mattress on the floor and then cement underneath. It was it's surprisingly comfy. I can kind of sleep anywhere. And I had my little cat, Remy. He was hanging out in there. He was asleep. But as I'm... I'm laying on my little futon on the cement. And I remember one night I went to go to sleep 
and I shut the light off, and I closed my eyes, and I felt all over my back, on my neck and my head, I felt fingertips pushing through the mattress. It felt like probably 20, 30 hands, all just kind of trying to lift me with fingertips. I felt them all over from my back to my neck. Immediately opened my eyes, turned on the light. I was like, that's obviously impossible. Like, nothing could do that. But it totally creeped me out, and I'm sitting there, the light's on. I close my eyes, and I start to feel it again. All these, and it was only when I closed my eyes when I felt all these fingers would, it felt like someone, felt like a bunch of people under me were kind of poking me with their whole hand. It was very, very disconcerting. And so, I opened my eyes again, and that happened a few times. And then eventually I was like, this has to be, this is either really happening, and this is all they're going to do, or it's all in my head. And so, just like Ariana Grande, I just made the decision to fall asleep. So that is an interesting part of her story, because I've experienced it myself. And I've said that before, there's a lot of stuff that I read that I'll kind of dismiss out of hand, because I haven't experienced it. That's just part of kind of being a skeptic and not really knowing where where the division between someone telling an entertaining story and somebody actually telling the truth. But I've experienced that. Where you only It only happens when you close your eyes. But there could actually be some sort of psychological component to that. That being said, let's go back and talk about the other issues with her story. So the idea of a photo being 666 megabytes, I, that's possible. But the thing is, is that part didn't necessarily ring true because generally you can send files, correct me if I'm wrong, in 2013 even, a file that's 666 megabytes isn't, in, isn't incredibly large. Now, it could have been that the file was 666 gigabytes and that wouldn't be impossible to send it could be that she i'll say this i don't think she made the story up i think there may be parts of it that aren't there absolutely are parts of it that aren't factually correct but i don't think she's making it up and you'll see what i mean so let's take it apart though she has the file 666 megabytes the number 666 is the mark of the beast it's a there's even debate about that whether or not that's the actual mark of the beast but It's generally assumed with satanic imagery that file should still be allowed to be sent, did. And it's possible that it was 666 gigabytes and she misread it. It's possible that that part of the story is not entirely true. But again, I think the other elements of her story are true. So I I don't think she's making that up. Is there a chance that she took a photo and it had proof of demonic activity on it and it was 666 megabytes slash gigabytes? It's possible. I think that's probably the weakest part of her story, honestly. I think that's the part of her story that I'm questioning it a little bit. But for whatever reason, she had a photo and she deleted it. Now, the fly in the car, that's a sign of the devil. Beelzebub was the Lord of the Flies. That could be a coincidence that she's driving in her car and there's a fly, a single fly in her car. And to jump to the conclusion... I can understand if I, if she just saw the fly in her car and jumped to that conclusion, it may be ridiculous. But when she's connecting it with the smell of sulfur and the ghosts, the negative activity where she was at, I mean, she would actually make a pretty decent paranormal investigator because she didn't say there was just a fly in the car and that means demons. She There was other elements that added to it. But I'm assuming there actually was a fly in the car. I'm assuming, I, again, I don't think she's lying. But the biggest issue with the story, it's wrapped in a bunch of mythology that can easily be dismissed. That Ariana Grande wasn't being trying to be a liar about it. It's actually just not factually true. And that's the story, the legend of Stoll Cemetery. So let's talk about that briefly. This episode is definitely going to run long. So Stoll Cemetery is a spooky well, I shouldn't say spooky. It's a it's a cemetery in the middle of Kansas, and it's actually it doesn't get explored a lot by... There's never been a paranormal investigator show shot out in Stoll Cemetery, despite its legendary reputation as being one of the seven gateways to hell. And there's a few reasons why. One, it's out in the middle of nowhere. But so this town of Stoll was founded in 1857. It's only a few buildings. It's not even really a city. It's an unincorporated town. So to people who don't live in America, there's basically like, we have cities and we have suburbs. And then every so often there's little breakaway towns. Sometimes on the, they're on the edge of suburbs, sometimes in the middle of nowhere. But they're not an, considered an actual city. It's just buildings. 
and a place people live. You have to incorporate to become a city. So, Stoll was a little town. In 1912, it only had 31 people. The max amount of people that it has had is about 50 people. There may be a few more people there now, but it's just a very, very small town. Before cars, it was a two-hour trip to the nearest town. Now, now Stoll, the city of Stoll, had two major tragedies. One was they were doing a controlled burn on a field, and a, a little boy got lost in the field, and he got circled by fire and burned to death. The second big tragedy they had in that town was one person went missing, and they later found him hanging from a tree. Now, those wouldn't even be on the radar for most cities, townships in America. But when you only have, you know, 30 to 50 people, one death is a big deal. And of course, the little boy dying in the burning fields, horrible. And the guy hanging from the tree, those are horrible incidences, but they're not these major tragedies in most cities that have, you know, 10,000 people, 20,000 people, so on and so forth. Now, the first time, Stoll Cemetery is exactly what it sounds like. It's just the cemetery. Apparently, there was a professor at the University of Kansas who would tell the students at the college that Stoll Cemetery was a gateway to hell. It was one of the seven gateways. He would tell this story to college kids. It sounds a lot like me, just kind of just riffing on, you know, riffing to people. And in 1974, the University Daily Kansan, Kansasin, Kansan, was the newspaper for the University of Kansas. They ran a story about Stoll Cemetery as one of the gateways to hell. That's where the legend started. No one, other than this professor, there was really nobody else talking about this. And the newspaper ran this article, and it totally took off. The article posits, posits? The article says that the gateway opens at midnight on the spring equinox and on Halloween, and that is when the devil can pop out of it. There is a church there, the Evangelical Emmanuel Church, that is now possessed by the devil. The church has been torn down now. But it had no roof at a time, and the legend went that even on rainy nights, with no roof, the inside of the church was bone dry. It was the power of the devil keeping the rain out. Seems like an odd power for the devil. Why would he care if the church got wet? Does he not like water? Then don't tell me it's because hell's on fire. But anyway, so he would keep water from getting into the church. There was legends that there were rich witch trials in Kansas. There never were. There was no record of them, at least. So this legend just grew and grew and grew. In 1980, people just started descending upon this little town of 50 people. And they were rowdy teens and college students. They're like, yeah, we're going to be here. We're going to see the the devil show up on the equinox. We're going to watch the devil come out on Halloween. It ended up peaking in 1988. 500 people showed up on Halloween and nothing happened, of course. And they trashed the graveyard. Now cops are stationed there, generally on those two days, but they usually have a guard as well. In 1999, a news crew showed up to be like, hey, we're going to investigate the story. And they got ran off by the townspeople. They're like, we don't want you here. You guys are just trashing the place and everything like that. We got all these looky-loos coming. And that's the second reason why no ghost investigator show has ever come out here is because townspeople don't want them. They don't want any publicity. They are not. A, they could easily turn into a tourist town and have like gift shops where they sell little like gateway toys and little demon figurines, and people would go there and they'd look around the cemetery for a while, and then they'd blow a hundred dollars in their gift shop. But they refuse to do that. The people in town don't want any attention whatsoever, so no one can investigate it. No ghost shows can show up. Nothing. Now, supernatural. The Stoll Cemetery is a big part of their mythology. One, the two Winchester boys were actually born in Kansas. And Kripke, Eric Kripke, the creator of the show, Supernatural, said he did that. He placed them there because of Stoll Cemetery. And then the season finale for season five, this great huge battle, takes place in Stoll Cemetery because they're going to face down the devil and they have to do it at one of the gateways to hell. And I will say this briefly, again, episodes are running long, but first five seasons of Supernatural are great. If you're into the supernatural if you're into like action shows mystery shows and x-files type check out the first five seasons of supernatural they were great now the seasons after that they've been hit or miss but the first five seasons of supernatural are (laughs) they're really really good television if you're into this type of stuff definitely the first five seasons so it was interesting i was reading an article a reporter did go out to Stoll Cemetery. It was a very, very well-written article. I'll put it in the show notes, of course. But he said, he goes, you know, I watched The Supernatural and I read all this stuff about it. 
And you think it's this cemetery in the middle of nowhere. He goes, the town itself is in the middle of nowhere. Well, the cemetery is like right off the freeway. And there's a bunch of houses facing it. So he goes, I pulled up. And on one side of me was just cars flying by. On the other side of me was a bunch of townspeople sitting on their porch staring at me. He goes, it it was not what I expected. He goes, I expected this spooky cemetery. He goes, it's just regular cemetery. It's just very noisy. There's people all, really, there's witnesses all around you and things like that. I'm assuming Ariana Grande's car was probably going down that freeway. Maybe they took a short detour, but it's totally accessible if you can get to the town. And the story that the Pope's plane refused to fly over Stoll Cemetery, completely made up. The reference to that said it was in a Time Magazine article. The Pope never said that. The pilot never said that. There's no confirmation that it ever happened. Completely made up story. The Pope has no problem Flying the Pope plane over Stoll Cemetery. But I will say this. It is really weird that the townspeople don't want any attention. Because again, Roswell, their entire tourist industry, millions of dollars a year based on holding up this idea that aliens crashed there. And you can look at all other sorts of Winchester Mystery House. You can look at all these other touristy trap places in America and really around the world that are like the most haunted city on the in the world, the most haunted house in the world. You know, this is a haunted tree. Come visit the haunted tree and go to our gift shop. So it's one of two things. Either the people in Stoll really do not want a bunch of people coming around, poking around their graveyard, or they're possibly covering something up. Is it really a gateway to hell? And is it so ingrained in that area that the people who live there, rather than making a quick buck from people like Ariana Grande and every paranormal ghost show in in the world, rather than bringing them there and making millions of dollars, what if they know what's really there and the town is almost infected by some sort of dark spirit, some sort of dark energy almost controlling the town? Keep them away. Keep them away so they don't know what really goes on here. The Pope will fly his plane over it, but on the ground is there something darker covering up what's really going on in the town of Stoll. I can almost just imagine this town that looks normal at night, just 50 people. Even that seems bizarre that it's still so small, but it's normal during the day. It's closed off to outsiders. How do they have 50 people yet enough cops to guard the cemetery? The whole, the more you think about it, the the creepier it sounds. It almost seems plausible that you have this town that is set up for one reason and one reason only. To guard the gateway to hell. And not to guard it in the sense that Sam and Dean Winchester would go to shut it down. But to work for some sort of supernatural darkness. It's their guardians. It's the ones that keep people away All year round. So those two nights when the gateway does open, the dark ones can enter our world unseen. They could make a lot of money. I could be putting sinister implications on a town that would just rather be left alone. A small town with an old, quiet, slow way of life. But sometimes the cover-up is what ends up making things more suspicious. Is there anything at Stoll Cemetery? We may never know. But it's likely that the people in the town of Stoll definitely have the answer. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great weekend, guys.